All right, welcome to RMAF 2011 Headroom TV here with George Cardis from Cardis Audio, uh, one of the leading lights certainly in the cabling industry, and uh, you know a great friend of Headroom. Uh, all kinds of great products from Cardis at Headroom. You guys should check it out. George, welcome. You're welcome. Jeez, I've never been on TV. Before. <laughs> it's Headroom TV, so it's not really TV. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's very close though. Um, so I guess the exciting part about what's going on this year for you is you're almost getting ready to introduce your your first headphone um, into the headphone firmament. Tell us a little bit about what led you into developing a headphone for Cardis Audio. Um, actually, what, what led it to is it, my son-in-law was a DJ, and I mean, you go back a few years, mm -hmm. and uh, he had a problem with his headphone cables breaking, mm -hmm. and he asked if I could make something that wouldn't break. And I went, oh, yeah, sure, so... I made it something, and he goes, he goes, my God, those things sound really good, you know. And he was using them on Sennheiser 600s or 580s or some such thing, you know. I went, really? They're that good? Oh, God, they're really good. So I went, fine. So I, I, I made cables for the Sennheisers and bought a few pairs of, of headphones and started playing around. And, and it was kind of enjoyable or one thing or another, but I, I went to a can jam early on, and I went on, and it was like, oh, my God, the people were so cool. You know what I mean? It was like high-end audio back in the beginning. It was yeah. like people were into music and they were really, you know, getting involved in it and listening and, and, and interacting. And it, it was just, it was phenomenal. So I became kind of enamored with the whole deal, Sure. you know. So I started making headphone cables and different sorts of things. And at some point in time, Logitech came along. And they wanted me to make cables for them. Well, they're a big lumbering company, you know, one thing or another. And I went, okay, whatever. So send me some of what you got. So they sent me some ear, whatever, earbuds. I don't know what you call these things. In-ear monitors. Yeah, everything. In ear. Earbuds. Crap you shove in your ear, you know. And it was like, God, uh, they were annoying. Yeah. Okay. And, and it wasn't. So I went out and I bought every kind of shove in your ear thing I could find. And it was all <laughs> kind of annoying. I mean, it was like, I hate that. I'm like, <laughs> so... <laughs> I went, I got I to gotta do something here. So I set out to let's make something that didn't annoy me when I put it in my ear so I could test the cables. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So it was really about not annoying. Yeah, yeah, it was about not annoying. And so I began to buy a bunch of stuff and look at it, and it was mostly all Chinese, and it was mostly all made for expediency of construction. So basically they'd have a driver or a, you know, a bunch of hearing aid drivers, something in a box, and then they would basically drill a hole and, you know, put it in a box and drill a hole in the box and hang a piece of rubber on it and you stuck it in your ear. And that was, how fast can we make that? How many can we make? And no f***ing consideration for whether it was annoying or not. Mm -hmm. They wanted it was it look good, you know? Yeah. Fashion kind of was driving the thing. Yeah. And uh, so I got to looking at it, and there were some basic flaws in the system. Um the more drivers they put in them, the less musical they were. Uh, the musician stuff was, was all real flat and had a lot of cut through to it, which seems to work for monitoring. They didn't care if it's musical or not. They're the musicians, for Christ's sure, sake. Sure. So uh, that stuff was somewhat evolved, but not along a, a musical field level. Okay. So I got to analyzing, and, I, and the first place we went was look, we've got to make this thing mirror the human hearing system. Why not? I mean, it's the same size in the same place and, and one thing or another. So we made the curve on these bells, on the input, to the same as the cochlea, which very conveniently is the shape of my logo. So, <laughs> so it ties you know, some, sometimes life works that way, yeah. you know. And so here we have an example of a prototype. And I can't, well, these are a prototype. I got lots of prototypes. So these are coming along pretty well. But you see... It's a section of a Nautilus there. And then on the inside is the same way. It took me a year to get somebody to make that shape. You know, because it's not a straight line. It's not a, a circle. It's not a cone. You know, it's a very specific shape. And it has a non-repeating tangent to it. So it's continually changing. Mm -hmm. And that's why it sounds good. Because it doesn't make a signature ring. Mm -hmm. Okay? And right, makes, right. It makes something that the ear can't... It's like a wall. If you make a wavy wall and every wave is a different length, you won't see it. But if you make every one repeat, you'll see it. Okay? Right. So this, this basically is an impedance converter that converts what's going on with the driver to your eardrum, you know, thing that sticks in your ear, and it mimics, mimics the cochlea, mm -hmm. all right? So you don't hear it. 
And I began to realize that, gee, you couldn't make the damn things linear. You could actually make them to where they sounded musical, you know. And was your goal linearity in the first? At first, no. My goal was something that feels good, and, you know, sounds good, and it's musical and articulate, and and so on. I, I don't. I mean, I would be so happy if things were linear, but I'd much rather they were musical. I'm not going to give up the musicality to make it linear. That's bullshit, you know. Because you you can you can make the bottom bigger than one thing or another, but if it don't integrate, it don't feel right. Okay, and that's about time. Sure. Okay, seamlessness. That's right, and it, it's a time cohesiveness, and that's why you have to take a single driver and just take it as far as you can go, which is what this is. So in the end, I realized that you know the, what was there, you couldn't get one to match your eardrum. They were too big or too small, and because if it's a sealed system, if you can't get it to have the same cross-sectional area as your eardrum, sure. or at least close, you're gonna have a heck of a time getting this thing to to sound right and work right. So we ended up making a driver. And it's a little half size thing to, to match the eardrum. And if I could take that, and a lot of the prototypes you could unscrew, this one you can't. But the driver inside, if you were to look at it, looks like a little Sennheiser 800 driver. You know, it kind of like got a big coil and sitting driver. Yeah, kind of like that. It's a cone driver, it's just fancy, you know. Uh, and best magnetic materials. And we went through surrounding materials, it's been out of copper. We found copper or brass, whatever was far superior to plastic, aluminum, all the thing that they are made out of. It's a pain in the butt to machine, but it sounds good and it doesn't interfere magnetically with what's going on. And that's critical in these because the magnetic field is so intense uh, in such a small area. So like the frame of the driver and things like that can easily interact. So at the end of the day, we ended up making every damn part in it. Every wow. single one, including this thing here is a miracle. See, because people, they fall out of their ears, you see. But this one here, no way. I can go run, I can jog, I can run up and down the stairs, wow. I, I can do push-ups, I can go swimming. Understand, and it, and it won't come out of my ear. Right, right. All right. And the reason is because we designed these things. They see they're super thin, and they're not a hemisphere. Uh huh. Okay, so <laughs> it's a very <laughs> delicate little shape, and, and and dude, it didn't just happen. <laughs> and so that they want to expand in the ear, but they're thin, so they're not hot. They're not like the like the foam ones. You want, I mean, they're, they're just damn uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, and they seal in a, in a way that puts pressure and heat in your ear, whereas these don't. These are free and easy. So that was a big part of the design, was getting that straight. Awesome. There wasn't anything about it that we didn't have to redesign. So it's really kind of a Cardis design from the ground up, from scratch. How long have you guys been on R in R&D on this product? Years. Two solid years. I remember you guys kind of introduced the first prototype at CES, I think, 08, was it? Or no? I'm my pocket. <laughs> well, and, uh, you know, I mean, I didn't really introduce them, but, I, you know, I mean, I know... So many of you guys that, yeah. you know. So I guess the next big exciting thing in the, at uh, this year's RMAF and Cardis is the clear headphone cable. Also been in production for quite a while, kind of doing a lot of R&D on that. Uh, so, George, let's uh, talk a little bit about um, the Cardis cable. And certainly, yep. And uh, at Hedrum, we've been carrying Cardis cables, replacement cables for headphones for 650s, for HD800s. Really, since the beginning, uh, we also have a Cardis replacement cable for K702s. And the most recent addition to the line would be the Cardis Clear Cable. And this one is for HD800 in particular, but we'll probably have some for 650s too. Tell us a little bit about the cable. Well, I've been making a lot of different things for different items for sticking your ear stuff here. But I've never, to do this was really difficult because if you've ever looked at a clear cable, it's built up in layers. And so it's made up of what appears to be two conductors, which are actually four that you have a single conductor, it's built up in layers, and then there's an insulating layer, then more layers, so it's a concentric, it acts like a monopole. In other words, the positive and negative are embodied in the same equal structure, okay, which comes very close to containing its own field, but not quite, because one's outside of the other. Mm -hmm. So to make it perfect, what you do is you take two of them and twist them together and you invert them. So you take the inside of one couples to the outside of the other and vice versa. So they become a mirror image and they cancel their own field. So when you get in a situation where current's flowing, this becomes real important, like in a speaker cable. Mm -hmm. But to make a very tiny one's very difficult because the parts are very tiny and the, and the, and the, the strands are very fine and, and you, you kind of reach the limits of your machinery because you have to put so many twists in to get the length right and, and so on. So it took a long time. But anyway, bottom line is, there it is. I actually it is. did it, and uh, it would be. It, it, and this would work with headphones or something. Eventually, 
some years down the road. Uh, I'll come up with a similar thing in net size for the small ones, but but see, it's actually two individuals mm -hmm. all the way all down. Way down. Yeah. Yeah, check this out. Uh, that's a slide. Where's the here? That is sweet. Yeah, you see, it's got a, a little rubber O ring that, mm -hmm. that holds it in place, and it's very it's not move around. Yeah, and slick. Mm -hmm. Very slick. nice. But uh, so anyway, that's a that's a clear headphone cable. And uh, what's the kind of the uh, one of these going to be ready for us? Well, I guess they're ready now. I'm ready now. Awesome. So as long as you don't want too many of them. <laughs> well, well, we'll start small and work our way up from there with the Carter's clear cables. Yeah, we'll... I want to thank you, George, for coming out to uh, Headroom and visiting with us and visiting for RMF 2011. Headroom TV, George Carter's. Thanks for visiting.